tonight, oh, I'm so excited for tonight. Yes. Um, I'm going to try to like keep it under control here because I'm so excited. But tonight we have just got two people that are going to have so much to share with you on so many different levels. But tonight we're going to talk about creativity, evolution, and adaptation with Melissa Jaqua and Abe Barron. Melissa was an, has been an international platform artist. She worked with John Paul Mitchell Systems for over 20 years, member of Hollywood's elite local 706 hair and makeup union. She's uh, her work's been on The Voice, America's Next Top Model, So You Think You Can Dance, Dancing with the Stars, American Idol, New Girl, <sighs> lots, lots and stuff. And of course, internationally acclaimed photo work. Um, she had the prestigious North American Hairstylist of the Year Award. And our friend Abe, such a cool history. Abe is an ex-gang member whose career started off in the construction world. Last thing he ever thought he'd been doing is becoming an inspiration in the hairdressing world. But Abe was one of the very first assistants at Robert Cromines, one of the first artistic team members for John Paul Mitchell Systems. And he was an integral uh, design, or sorry, he designed the education programs and training for new talent and at Robert Cromine's salon. His work has also been seen on lots of TV shows. And now he and Melissa have the coolest traveling salon called The Workshop. And that's based out of San Diego. So after that incredibly long winded explanation, <laughs> let's get to the real stuff. Guys, please welcome in the chats, Abe and Melissa. Hi, Hi guys. <laughs> Thank you. So guys. happy to have you both here. Thank um, you. Sam wanted me to first just give you both a big virtual hug <laughs> on his behalf. Definitely mm -hmm. wanted to share some welcome. But we're so stoked to have you here because I think one of the things that in our industry is so important is that we have an opportunity to learn from the people that have paved the way before us. And, you know, I don't think you guys probably get enough credit for how instrumental you've been in so many hairdressers lives. And we're super excited just to, to peel into the past and into the future too, because there's some really cool stuff happening in the future. So I'd just be interested, like when you, when you look back at the um, history that you have, the experiences that you have, what do you feel is most important about just like the journey that you've led? Oh man. That's a large question. <laughs> yeah, I like to throw out the big question <laughs> first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that it, it at, for me, like you've talked about how I started, um, where I came from. I think for me, where I came from to jump into an industry that's full of culture and, and very artistic was a whole different world. Um, the rebirth that I had to do to, to like set inside of the, of the industry. Um, when I look back now, it was like building a whole new person. Uh, the experiences who I became, it, it, it completely changed me into a whole different character. Um, uh -huh. you think that that's probably the best thing, like what the industry has given me to be able to travel the world and meet so many people and artistic people and be at tables with so many different characters. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably been the biggest thing for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we get to it's meet so people true. every day, you know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. That's a question. <laughs> Just when you look back at your journey so far, because I know it's, it's still continuing to, really to expand, but when you look back at your journey, what do you feel is like so important about the journey that you've had? Wow. Um, the first thing that comes up for me when you say that is just how how much how much how amazing it feels to um, always contribute back. So every, I feel like every chapter, every part of my journey, there's always been um, I've taken some of that and then given back and contributed and shared and, and helped others because I'm a person that like I love to learn and I always ask too many questions I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> no such thing, right? Okay with that. Cause uh, it's, it's, it's my process. And, and when I learn the first thing I think of when I learn something new is, Oh my God, I can't wait to show somebody else this or teach this. 
or yeah. take it and do something with it so I can share it with people somehow, you know, whether it's do it on a head for a TV show or, you know, at a hair show or whatever it is. So the whole journey, there's been those moments constantly. And that's the thing that fulfills me the most, I think. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I mean, without, without him, I wouldn't have met her. Yeah. I was 19, you know, working as an assistant behind stage. And, uh, yeah. So cool. Yeah, it was my friend Carla Navo and I, we always talk about how the, the hair industry is like this gateway drug of sorts. <laughs> like you have no idea how many opportunities and different paths you're going to go down when you first step foot into this industry, right? Yeah. And how many of you guys in the, the comments just put a me if you are with us so far that where you're at today is probably not where you pictured you would be as you first stepped into the industry. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, my, my mom made me become a hairdresser and she thought her, her whole thought process was either you're going to join the Navy or be a hairdresser. And if I was a hairdresser, no matter where I went in the world, I would have a craft that always mm -hmm. people would always need me. The computers wouldn't take over. But I think she thought I'd be up at like at Supercuts or something like that. And I think that, you know, talking about the evolution of where you are, I would never have thought from that moment where she my mom you do what your mom says. Like when my mom tells me, she forced me to do this stuff. I would have never thought I'd be where I'm at now. Yeah. yeah. Was your mom a hairdresser, Abe? No. Huh. I had my first in high school and she's like, construction is a good job, but you have to get something more to be able to be supportive and you need something that's like every day. So she said, Navy will give you retirement and insurance and you're going to travel the world and hair will give you a job that no matter where you go in the world, you'll have a craft that computers will never take over. Wow. Well, there aren't hot girls in the Navy. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, so let's I, be honest. I should Let's say be that. honest here, right? Like, as a man, when you step into that first salon environment, you're like, <laughs> yeah, I want to hang out here. Yes, this would be great. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, Shirley. Shirley says, Abe's mom knew. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So what got you connected with with Chromians? Because I mean, that was right when he was just very first starting to to kind of click and take off. Yeah, I, I dialed the wrong number. Um, I had gone to my teacher. We had this guy come in. His name was William William to teach, and I wanted to work for him. And she says, "Don't aim so high." He was an educator for Paul Mitchell, and she says, "Start lower and work your way up." And so I had gone to this little salon and was hating it and wanted to quit doing hair and. A friend of mine gave me uh, a phone number to a woman named Floor who was uh, a hairdresser and an uh, educator for Paul Mitchell and said that she needed an assistant. And when I called, I dialed the wrong number, got Robert Salon, had no idea. I said, I heard you guys are looking for an assistant. And they said, yeah, I come in on, on Friday. And I came in and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. And knew right away I was in the wrong spot. Yeah. Wait. And Robert had... Robert wasn't Robert. He was still Gene Bra's assistant on, mm -hmm. on stage and stuff. And he was just taking over the salon. It was Gene Bra salon. Um, and when I remember walking down the stairs, I saw the pictures he had and I, 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 it clicked who he was. And then I was really like, Oh my God. Like, and he came back, I had a hangout day and uh, I hung out for the day and he had told me that he had hired somebody from my school and that I probably wasn't going to be the one. And, uh, he said, whenever you want to come back and hang out, come and hang out. So I showed up every day. I called my three jobs in sick the whole week, and I showed up every day to work. And at the end of the week, he said I was hired. So yeah. cool. Yeah. Melissa, how did you get connected with the, the Paul Mitchell world? Uh, well, um, back in Toledo, Ohio, where I'm from, I was working in a very tiny little two-chair salon. It was actually my best friend Scott Beavers it was his mom and um, I had this literally like this little corner in the salon and I just it's like I made it my own salon it was interesting I, I had pictures of tear sheets and models all around the mirror and you know just all kinds of stuff up and she was doing like all the little blue haired ladies you know? <laughs> and I remember a person came in and said you know that they were selling Paul Mitchell, selling consultant, and that they wanted to speak to us about carrying the line. Well, my my mom's friend wasn't really interested. She wasn't like into carrying a whole line just for her little old ladies that she sees. Yeah. Um, but 
I told them uh, I wasn't interested because and I'm not carrying something that's in the drugstore. So that caused them to then want to set a time to have a conversation with me about diversion. And so I was like, okay, whatever, I'll talk to them about it. And so we set up a time to sit down and uh, they educated me on diversion and they educated me a little bit on the product. And in the meantime, I was secretly in love with my hair sculpting lotion like their number one <laughs> but I didn't want to take the whole line on you know because of what I said but by the time I got done speaking with them I got I got engaged and I started to understand and I saw opportunity and um, I went to my first hair show not long after that and I saw somebody on stage and I learned that Paul Mitchell had an education program so it all just kind of it was like romanced me in slowly and next thing you know I was like drinking the bullet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, here's what I think is is like super cool about the the start for both of you. Uh-huh. I mean, both of you have had incredible careers so far and and probably careers that a lot of people watching out there are like, yeah, that's the kind of career I want to have. He had started as a construction worker and right. was like, okay, cool, I'm going to go to hair school and accidentally called Robert Cromine Salon. Yeah. Melissa started at a little salon in Toledo, Ohio, and it all started with just a product conversation with their local rep. Like, this is what's really important here, y'all. And I hope there's some students out there watching too, because it doesn't have to be in this, um, this big grand thing to get you to where you want to go, yeah. right? Completely. Yeah. Yeah. So what what is it that and you know these are great and these are great little things that started the the footprints right like it started you into the career but then what kind of took you from um, what kind of took you from okay there's a foot in the pond to okay now the career is really taking off and really growing. Uh, for me, it was I have to. Um, hmm. You know, I had two kids. Uh, right out of high school, one in high school, one right out of high school. And um, I had to be a grown up and I had to support them. So I had no choice. And the good thing about working for Robert when I first started with Robert is um, Robert showed me what it was like to be a successful hairdresser. You know, when my mom thought I was going to work at Supercuts, you're talking, you know, not, nothing bad about Supercuts, but you're looking at somebody who gets paid hourly, right? right. Then I come over to Robert and Robert's making $1,500 a day. You know, and driving a nice car and, you know, he's six figure hairdresser. I think the first year I worked for him, he made more money than the president of the United States. And that to me is crazy because they say that we're hairdressers run educated and stupid, you know, and it's right, like, yeah. he's the guy who makes more money than the president of the United States. So I took on that if he could do that and I'm learning from him, I, I can only imagine what I can create for my children. So it became a really quick click for me that. I have to, I have to do this. So I mimicked everything he did, um, soaked it all in. I would, after work, I probably bothered him so much. I would go sit in his Mercedes with him when he was in there smoking a cigarette, trying to get away from everybody, just (laughs) question after question. And I would put it to work because I knew that I had an end game, right? We say now that what's, what matters to you is what we, you know, what we ask people when they come work for us. And I think that that was what was clicked for me is what mattered to me was my children. And mm-hmm. I made it a, a, a choice that it was all or nothing. And when you have somebody in front of you, like Robert, who does what he does, I was not going to do anything less than that. Yeah. yeah, That's awesome that you had that push, you know, from both the inspiration of your children, but you also had a great mentor that was showing you the whole time, hey, look what's possible. Look what's possible. And it's one of the things that saddens me today about the industry is you have this idea out in the world of people want to be their own boss and you know you're looking at a bunch of shifts and we had talked earlier a couple weeks ago about the shift in the industry and there there's been a shift with this whole solar salon thing and you got a bunch of kids going right into these salons and there's nothing wrong with the salons but you don't have that mentor you don't have someone who can show you what's possible Mm -hmm. you know and when we teach and talk to kids it's i ask you know all of them want to be six figure hairdressers it's just like, well, you can't work for somebody who does $50,000 to teach you how to be a six-figure hairdresser. So how are you going to go into a solo salon making no money, not understanding how to make money, how to run the business, and figure that you're going to be a six-figure hairdresser right away? 
you know, the mentorship is important. Finding somebody who, who is the person you want to be, right? right. If you want to work mm -hmm. in Hollywood, you got to work for somebody who works in Hollywood, you know, not for somebody who doesn't, because how are they going to show you how to get there? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing, you know, just to be able to have that. And I think people today don't want that. People want to be their own boss. And yeah. That title, boss, you know, I'm boss. And you're the boss of yourself. <laughs> you know, your clients are always the boss, literally. You know, no matter what you think, you're never truly the boss. Right. Yeah, I, I, I have to admit, I, I had the same kind of concerns when I started to see more like the salon suite environment come up, you know, and... And, you know, I, I do have to say to Sola's credit, because we, we have good relationships with that group, they, uh, I think they, out of a lot of those groups, recognize that that's still such an essential essential part. And they do a lot of work actually with Paul Mitchell, with the group Paul Mitchell, to make sure that the stylists are getting some mentorship. But it's really easy for even someone that works with a company like that, that is offering that as an opportunity. It's easy for someone to come out of school, just start kind of like, trying to feel their way through and without that mentorship, without that leadership, it, it is, it's easy to get really lost and not have that inspiration. Well, you need the, when you go get a trainer, right? It's your, yeah. that person's kicking your ass all day long to push you to do what you're doing. When you're yeah. by yourself, it's already hard to do that. So not having somebody, I mean, I was blessed in the salon. I had Robert, I had Stephanie Pochowski, I had Takashi mm -hmm. I had Kelly Cardenas. Like this was my, my inner circle. You know that that pushed me no matter what, and I think that that's that little um, circle of influence is important because it keeps you uh, accountable. You need somebody to keep you accountable. Yeah, yeah. So what what pushed you for your evolution, Melissa? Um, I think the thing that I think about first when you ask that is finding my tribe. <laughs> um, just feeling like where I grew up, there, there weren't really many people like me um and mm. i loved growing up where i grew up but it wasn't the most you know metropolitan artistic community to nurture the weirdo in me i guess <laughs> <laughs> i love that the artist i mean i'm i'm the one that i don't know i just everybody always say like if i dress is put something on like what is this thing you're wearing? What's it called? Or what is this look? Or, you know, why do you do that? Or, you know, your pants don't match your shirt. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> so I think when I got into hairdressing, you start to see, you know, you're around other artists and you're like, oh, welcome to my people. You know what I mean? You start walking towards yeah. them and like, ah, other people like me, other people that think outside the box, other people that create. And and heading in that direction, kind of like what you're saying, Ed, you know, just start getting surrounded by um, different people that inspire you to be the best you can be or be better. Or sometimes, you know, I have that feeling of like, I want to be better than you, you know what I mean? So those things just push me and made me work. I just feel like every little step, you know, more and more and more. And um, I think just the commitment to always wanting to be the best at anything I take on for myself. Um, not necessarily to prove it to somebody else, but just for myself. Um, that has me um, try to master everything or, 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 you know, blow the expectation out of the, the box, I guess. So yeah. just in doing that, I think it just kept pushing and pushing and pushing me into the direction my life unfolded, my career unfolded to be. And, nice. yeah. and now she's trying to be more Midwest. Every day all she wears is camouflage. I'm like, seriously? What's the deal? I think she's trying to hide from me. I was shopping and it's like such a huge trend right now. I'm like, oh, that's cute, that's cute, that's cute. So I came home with all this camouflage stuff. I'm like, you can't see me. <laughs> we, have that, we have that joke with my sister. She loves everything camouflage. So when my my wife and I are out and about like looking at stuff, we see something cam. I'm like, oh, Tyra would like that. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. You just can't wear it all together. That's just a little too out of control. <laughs> right. Yeah. One of the one of the things I love about Melissa, what she was talking about in her story, is you know, I'm born and raised in San Diego. The mm -hmm. salon I got to work in is in San Diego. Like I didn't have to go anywhere. And mm -hmm. she had to go from you know, the Midwest to Los Angeles to do what she wanted to do. 
And that's wow. two different worlds, you know? And um, she told, she, when we were in the beginning, I was getting to tell Melissa about her, her uh, career, is that when she went to LA to, to check it out, to see if this is where she really wanted to be, before she left, she subscribed to a bunch of magazines, LA magazines, and she had them sent mm -hmm. to her house in the Midwest. Because one of the things that they told her when she went was that she wasn't quite ready, like work-wise, because it was not L.A. It was more Midwest and they weren't up to par yet. So she sure. started to rip out the magazines and started to dress like the people in L.A., starting to have the vocabulary of the people in L.A., like the whole mentality mm -hmm. in Ohio, right, before she moved out so she could be prepared. She was already doing her metamorphosis there, you know, which is, I think is pretty amazing when you think about it because not – that's what sets people apart is how do they think and do they think differently because they're out of the box. Like I would have never done that. I wouldn't have thought, hey, let me send me a bunch of magazines from the city I want to be in so I can start living in that purpose. You know, mm -hmm. she was living in LA over here. So when she moved, she was ready, which was pretty cool. Thank you. That's awesome. There, there's actually a really good book. Well, it the information's good. The book sometimes can get a little tough to read and repetitive, but there's this book called Working Identity. And she talks about these different people that have shifted their working identity and what makes someone successful and what makes someone commonly fail and shifting that working identity. And what you just explained was two big things that she talks about that people have in common that have successful shifts like that. One is to start to put your foot completely into that pond before you even get there. Mm -hmm. Second is start to actually create a circle where you can start to be in communication with those people that are also doing those things. And so that's so cool that you kind of started that just by like tapping into the magazines and, you know, like you're saying, just, um, you know, styling yourself and sculpting yourself to be ready for that moment where you fully step into it too. It's funny you said that second thing. Say it again. What was the second thing? Just to connect with somebody. Yeah, else. starting to connect with people in that in that world. Right. So, so before I went out to LA to check it out the first time, I actually sat in front of a television and I wrote down the names of all the hair and makeup people that worked on all the TV shows that I aspired to work on, and I wrote them all letters. This is back when you know that's all we had was right. Mail. <laughs> that, that doesn't sound email, big, huh? right? That doesn't sound big, but you know, think about little TV with only eleven stations. I had right? twelve. Well, <laughs> right? No, no, no remote control or TiVo to stop the credits. They go fast, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then she had to wait for the guy on the horse to come get the mail. <laughs> <laughs> no. So she, I'm curious, Melissa. Did did anyone get back to you? Did like did they respond to you? I got one response. Um, and it was from a guy named Bob Scribner and Bob was at the time the, the department head for, uh, back then the department heads were for both makeup and hair, even though he was a makeup person. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was the department head for NBC for the tonight show. And, um, yeah, he just wrote me and said, you know, thanks for writing. Uh, if you're ever out in LA, here's my number, call me, be happy to meet with you. And that was oh. all I needed. That was all I needed. <laughs> so, so you better believe I booked my ticket. I saved my money and I flew out there and called him and said, I'm here. <laughs> and awesome. reminded him about the letter. And he was kind enough to uh, uh, invite me to, to the Tonight Show uh, studio to come meet with him. And I went there and I, I brought a portfolio that I worked really hard on from just doing before and afters of my, my guests. And... Mm -hmm. um, presented it to him and asked him, you know, to give me his opinion. And how do I, basically I sat there and said, how do I get to do what you do? I want to do what you do. Yeah. And that's when he shared with me all about um, getting into the hair and makeup union to do TV and film. So, so yeah. Cool. And part of the craziest story of that is a couple of years ago, she was on set working with somebody and she was telling them this story and the girl said, that's my uncle. <laughs> Rad. Nuts. Well, yeah. not, not only it was her uncle, but she was the daughter of another woman that I worked with all the time. So it was, it was her brother. She had no idea. And I'm like, so are you cool. kidding me? That's your brother? So I literally have a text on my phone from the woman who 
I'm talking about saying, um, let me know when you're free. I want to get you and Bob like on the phone together or something. That would be so cool. So cool. Very, very cool. I love this. And man, I, I, Kurt, I hope you're watching and I, I hope you're taking notes because I think this is this is a show we have to get out in front of the students because this is the stuff that people want to do. And, and again, I kind of the, back to that same comment earlier, I think people dream that it has to be this complicated process. But it, I, I think you're both sharing with us that Yes, you have to put the work in. And of course, you have to have the will and the push because it's not easy to just pick up and move from Toledo, Ohio to Los Angeles. But it's not like that was a complicated thing. You just had to have that um, that excitement and that like kind of gutsiness to like just jump and go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is anything anybody wants to do. It's just one step at a time, you know? People say, well, how do I do, how do I get there? How do I do, how do I get to work in LA? I'm like, well, first book a plane ticket. You know, it's like, get yourself out of there. It's like just one step at a time, you know? It's not yeah. things that are difficult. You just have to do them, you know? But social media today has changed the game completely to where it's not hard at all. I mean, we would go in and teach and tell kids, this is hard and it takes forever. And then nowadays we say that and kids within a week of graduating are working on set somewhere. Yeah, I mean, like the opportunities they have now are way, insane. You know? I mean, I would, I would kill to have the opportunities they have, but it's okay. I mean, we, we did the work we had to do and we're, you know, well-rounded and grounded for it, I, I would say. So, yeah. yeah. So when because you also, you know, both of you have had kind of different phases and different evolutions. Abe, I know that you um, eventually went and opened your own salon. You know, what what push did you get or what um, what catalyst happened to make you go, okay, cool, I've, I've done what I'm going to do here. It's time for me to take this shift and now I'll go in this direction. Oh, man, that's a, that's a deep question because... I don't know if I really answer that. <laughs> um, you know, I guess, right? Being authentic is is the best way. I worked for Robert for nine years, and I probably would have never left. Um, he was like my father. Um, I would have taken a bullet for that man. He like I grew up. Him and his wife Margaret were like my second parents. I started when I was nineteen with them, you know, and, mm -hmm. and my way through. And when we talk about what matters to us, like we talked about earlier. It just got to a point that what mattered to me was different than what mattered to Robert and it wasn't working anymore. And, you know, my whole intention and in when I opened up my salon um, was to have them as my business partners, but salon industry is different and difficult and weird sometimes with owners and employees. Um, so, you know, I did what I did and moved on and, and opened up my own place because I had, I, again, no choice. I, Robert always taught us that you don't go backwards, you go forwards. Well, Robert was the cream of the crop in salons in San Diego at the time. So where do I go from there? I can't go work for anybody else. And uh, which goes to standards and ideals. You know, we, I, we were definitely put in a whole box of standards and ideals of what hairdressers should be and what they should look like. And if you're not that way, then you suck. Um, so I was full game of I'm not going to go work for somebody else. I have to open a salon. And if I'm going to open a salon, I'm going to do it big. So we opened a 5,000 square foot salon with my first salon. Um, and then I ended up having, uh, it was a three-story building. I had uh, a spa on the second one. And then I did a like a cafe barbershop on the first one, uh, first floor. So I had three all going at the same time. And after about six years, I wanted to kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> How many salon owners out there know exactly what he's talking about? <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's going to that boss thing. You have, you're building a culture, you're building an idea. And when you have hairdressers that all want to be their own boss, they don't toe the line very well. Um, and that got kind of, I went from being very artistic to being a babysitter and it was really difficult, uh, where I just, I lost joy in it. So I had to step away for a while, but it was amazing six years, you know, up, up until then, like building this thing and getting it up and. Um, getting people built and coming up with creative ideas to bring clients in and stuff. It was, it was good. Yeah. 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 yeah and I think we even talked about it when we had our conversation, but there's kind of like the joke statement of the two best yeah. days in a salon owner's uh, life or the day they open and the day and that they sell it or close it. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's something gratifying when, when, when you become 
if you become a salon owner and you become a mentor, mm -hmm. you know, like one of the mm -hmm. things we talk to kids when we go teach, the first thing they want to all do is open a salon. They want to know about opening salons. And it's just like, if you, you're going to teach me, right? Like you think you're going to open a salon and just have a bunch of kids. Or you're going to have people that have been doing hair for 10 or 15 years that you have to lead. You know, you have to get stuff yeah. under your belt to be able to teach and lead them. Um, I think one of the most gratifying things of being a salon owner when you can be a mentor is 15, 20 years down the line when those people you coach call you and just thank you. So this happens to him all the time. And I'm kind of jealous because he gets these messages from his former assistants, employees all the time, just like bleeding out of their hearts with, with gratitude for everything. Mm. You know, those, I couldn't see it then, but oh my gosh, I'm so grateful now. And he gets these beautiful messages all the time from people. And I think that says a lot about you. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> we, we call it the bloodline. I gave them everything Robert gave me. You know, mm. Robert gave me everything Gene gave him. You know, and it's just it's yes. the DNA of it. As a person, if I, when I decided to own the salon was... I'm also in charge of these people and I need to grow them and teach them and give them everything I know. Uh, and and it, it, it's, it, I'd probably say that's the most, it hurts when they leave, you know, for whatever reason, good or bad. Uh, but it is amazing when you can reconnect and everything you taught them. Now they're teaching other people and they're growing. Um, one of my old assistants is, has programs now she's kicking ass and teaching people how to be a six figure hairdresser. And it's really cool to see what she's implementing, you know, and it's just, that's part yeah. of your DNA, your bloodline, you know, it's, it's cool. But at the same time, I mean, it's life, it's evolution, it's change. We, we all can't stay exactly where we're at. So it's to be expected. It's just sometimes hard for us because yeah. <laughs> you yeah. give them everything. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your current evolution, because I think this is a really fun transition that's happening. And, and I think it's so beautiful, especially in our the moment that we're in within the industry. So share a little bit about what you guys are currently doing. Go for it. <laughs> I, I kind of had to force uh, force her a little bit, kind of grab her by the hand and pull her along, but I think she's loving it now. Um, we, we decided to, uh, during the pandemic, um, you know, getting in California, they shut us down quite a few times and had yes. us down for a while. Um, and then reopening for those pockets and not opening fully. And as a fully functioning business, it's really hard to function at, at a 25% when you need to make 100% to cover your bills. And owners were not budging with, at least my owner wasn't budging with, with you know, paying rent. Um, so we started to look in, in, into different avenues and looking at some past history of people that made it out of disasters in the world you know the mm -hmm. depression and all that stuff and um, we decided to take a sprinter van and make it a salon yeah so we went uh on location um with our with our uh, business and did a two chair fully functional i mean you know we talk about about salons and business right and mm -hmm. you look at we looked at all the cars that we could have done and you know, we said if we're going to be charging a certain amount of money, we need to get the top of the line. So we went with the Mercedes mm -hmm. and then we looked at the inside and we went top of the line, solar uh, power, um, you know, our, our water heaters, top of the line costs us a little bit of money, but it's no different than building out a salon. Um, and now we do hair at the beach, at their house. It is the most amazing thing. Uh, two weeks ago, we pulled up to the beach, opened the door clients look in and all of a sudden there's dolphins jumping in the water and they're like are you kidding me right i was like i kind of did that that's going to cost you extra <laughs> we we actually had that happen we yeah. timed all this right it's an extra right with the dolphins next yeah. week there'll be fireworks yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so it's it's been an amazing ride um with this idea that we did and um i know we were probably not the first to do it um Definitely, um, when we did it, we were like, oh, this is great. We're going to be the first. And then we started looking around, and we started a lot of barbers that do this, mm -hmm. um, not really hairdressers. Yeah, there, um, there's a lot of barbers, and, and it's really cool and inspirational to look at them and what they've done and kind of, you know, quietly stand back and take notes about things that we could do differently to make it better yeah. or whatever. Um, and then also what seems to be working for them. But I think after getting into the 
filled out, we now understand why nobody's done an actual salon. <laughs> it's a whole different animal than just a barber shop, but we you are know, forging through it. <laughs> we also travel and teach, and with the airlines and all that, we can get in this thing and take off and go travel in it and go teach somewhere. I mean, we'll there's so many things yeah. we can do. We're looking at doing some um, inspirational classes, you know, Melissa Wanaha. And so a lot of people are always asking her to teach the, teach the whole photo thing. And mm -hmm. we live out in the desert. So we're like, we can do a whole two day, three day uh, thing with our, with the van out in the middle of the desert as a tool to do hair in, go out, get inspired in Joshua tree or something, jump in the van, mm -hmm. do some hair and go out and photograph. You know, I do photography now. I can photograph some stuff. And it's just, it's it's seeing things differently. You know, so when we started freaking out a bit about the closures and, you know, watching other people freak out and what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? I just knew that, you know, my dad being a businessman always taught me you got to think ahead and just, you know, think out the box, think ahead and, and make sure that you inlay the lines for what you're going to do. And so we started researching and researching and putting it together and, Melissa had my whole house full of um, those big sticky um, post-it post post notes, stickies. Yeah. Every day there was a new one. My whole house was like graffiti <laughs> with pictures and writing. And, we were having you know, our own board meetings every day. Every day. <laughs> yeah. Brainstorming. Yeah. yeah. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's worked out. Um, and, you know, people keep asking, are, are you going to go back to a salon? And I'm like, nah, this, this wasn't just a pandemic thing. Like, yeah. I wish, so we talk about standards, right? So if I go back 20 years, 15 years, you know, shoot, even 10 years, I would have been like, you're crazy. I will never do mobile. That's not what hairdressers should do. You yeah. know, you need to be in a mm -hmm. big salon. It's pimpy and all this stuff. And now I'm like, damn, if I would have done that a long time ago, my life would be so different. Mm -hmm. To actually be by the water, getting the breeze, clients smiling ear to ear. It's not even about the service anymore. It's about the whole package. Yes. And, you know, we talk about, oh, I want to be a hairdresser because I don't want to be in an office all day long. I don't want to be in a cubicle, you know, and getting in the van and going out and parking at the beach. I look now and I'm like, I was in an office, basically. <laughs> the salon was an office. And now with the pandemic, they put up cubicles and everything because you had to block off with the plastic things. I'm like, that's great. <laughs> you know, it's a cubicle. Um, but yeah, it's been really cool. Melissa takes it to LA and works with it in LA. And then I'll take it to San Diego and here in the desert, we have people, clients, my clients have come into town and call me and they come to the van or I pull the van up to their hotel. That is kind of the cool thing though. People are like, hey, you know, wherever you are, like people come into town, can you do my hair? Well, normally we'd be like, oh, well, our salon's in LA, our salon's in San Diego. Sure. Come on over, we, we can do your hair now. <laughs> yeah. So fun. Yeah. yeah, there's just so much freedom with that. I mean, like you saying, there there's so many options of how to utilize that kind of space. And um, yeah, the word freedom just kind of keeps coming to mind. And actually, when I saw Abe first post something about this van, I think my first response to him is like, this is the one way that I would potentially consider getting back into a salon is if I could have it on wheels. <laughs> right. right. So it, it, is, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, because I'm actually kind of curious how this whole whole thing works, too. Like, with this kind of setup, I'm imagining it's all appointment-based. Yeah. And it's interesting. Um, so the last time I had a walk-in was at Robert Salon probably 20 years ago. And now I get walk-ins every day. People come up to the van and are just like, oh, my. If I'm at a client's house, the people walking their dogs, all of them stop ask, can I get my hair done right now? And I'm like, I'm appointment based only like, but it's yeah. so crazy. I'm at the beach. People can I can probably go park at the beach with no clients and have a full day all yeah. day long. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. So it's definitely appointment based. Um, we're still working out some of the kinks on it, but I think what we're going to end up doing is having certain days that are strictly house calls and then certain days where clients come to us wherever gotcha. we like to park. But I think mostly now when people find out we're at the beach and I post the pictures of the sunsets, they're like, oh, I want that. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Right there, right? Like so the there might be a premium for sunset times, right? <laughs> happy hour, happy for us because we'll charge more. Now. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. It's really foregoing coming, the convenience of us coming to their house because they'd rather be at the beach. <laughs> but, you know, in that, you know, we didn't half ass it, right? So in our salon, we had these really cool um, 
uh, shampoo bowls that the clients lay down, right? So we wanted to make sure we were as close to that as possible. You know, we didn't want to run out of hot water. So we paid, you know, almost six grand for our water heater um, so that we have hot water all day long. It, I can run it all day. Never. You know, so we didn't, you know, jip on the small things just because it's in a van now. We wanted to make sure that when they stepped into it, they were still getting the same feeling of being in a salon and not being like, oh, I don't know mm -hmm. about this. You know, it sure. was the same thing. We yeah. have the infrared, you know, dryer hanging that comes out. You know, we the chairs, we, we went and bought special, upgraded the chairs into more, you know, uh, leather big chairs that they're just comfortable in that they just want to hang out in. Um, so, you know, it's just a matter of doing it. And Melissa decorating the inside is going to be, you know, that's what she does. My favorite, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And so with that, do you do you have specific places that you had to um, um, kind of work out with like the city or something like places that you can park it or is it private property that you park on? And You know, so oddly enough, it's funny because that was my biggest concern. I said, I don't want to be doing somebody's hair. And all of a sudden we get told we have to leave and sure. there's you no know, relaxer in their head or something. And that's the difference between us. I'm more of the gangster. Like, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it kick me out like fine i'll have to you know go with color in their hair what's going on i always have to cover all bases yeah <laughs> i have to know what's going to happen that's, right. that's yeah. what makes you a good team right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, but yeah so when we when we did the research in all the different uh, uh cities that we were going to be working in it turned out it wasn't too difficult at all we just got the permit we needed to do what we're doing and all we have to do is make sure we're on public property and uh, that our license is all kept up. And wow. yeah. California is a non-regulatory state, meaning that you can I can park anywhere as long as it's not private property uh, with just a business certificate. Wow, forty bucks. So wherever we decide to go, so we definitely right now we've done um, L.A., Orange County, and San Diego, um, and the desert where we live, and mm -hmm. that's where we do hair, and we just get business certificates are like 40 bucks mm -hmm. and I'm the man and I can go anywhere and park and on any street and do hair and they can't say nothing. So, so much fun. Yeah. It's so crazy. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be really difficult when she said, Hey, what about this? And I was like, Oh, I didn't think about that. And I thought we were going to have to pay a lot of money. And when I called, they were like, no, yeah. this is, I'm, I'm quite surprised, honestly. I was kind of thinking the same thing you were. I'm like, wow, that's a lot easier than I would have imagined. <laughs> I yeah. thought there'd be so many hoops. But, you know, I guess, and I know you guys are extremely more elevated wow. than like a dog grooming, you know, service. But you see dog grooming vans parked just in front of houses or wherever all the time. So I, I guess it kind of makes sense. Yeah. And it's why we don't call ourselves mobile because every time we say mobile, they say, oh, like the dog groomers. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody compared it the other day to a food truck and said, that's much cooler. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, no, we're not like, kind of like the dog groomers, but not like the dog groomers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, what do you feel like is, do you have a vision for the next evolution? I know you mentioned maybe doing some kind of um, photo shoot type stuff or like a traveling class sort of situation, but yeah, what do you feel is the next evolution for you? If you're asking me and, and not Melissa, I would say I want to I want to <laughs> do like ten of these. Yeah, and, and rent I mean, them out. The first in the nice. first week that we were building it out, he's like, "This is amazing. We should do a fleet. We should yeah. do a fleet." I'm like, "Can we just get through this one, please?" Yeah. <laughs> it's no. quite a project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after about two months into it, she's like, "No more. No more. I'm never doing <laughs> this again." Just because we we starting. Uh, you know, ground zero, knowing absolutely nothing about a build out of a van and the yeah. difficulty and the learning curves and the, oh shit, we didn't do that right. We got to do it again. And yeah, you know, just all of it. It was like, ah, don't talk about a fleet right now. Not right now. Right. But it's, again, when we go and teach, mm -hmm. every kid says the first thing they want to do is I want to travel. Mm -hmm. Not even hair. It's I want to travel. Yeah. You yeah. know, yep. if, if you're a kid, and I say kid, and I'm talking about younger, you know, we're a little older. Um, I know one that wants to do festivals. Go to festivals and do hair. Well, mm -hmm. what a perfect thing to have this where you can sleep in it, right? Pip it mm -hmm. out to sleep in it. Also make it a salon, and you can travel around to all the festivals you want and do hair and charge wherever you're right. going, you know, yes. and, and make money. And one of the things when we looked at it, you know, people always 
ask certain things about the, the business and, you know, why or, you know, why won't you go back to another salon? We really looked in depth to a lot of the things that were happening. And a couple of the things that we looked at, we saw a bunch of like articles and surveys. And there was one that said 60% of people that were sent home to work don't want to go back to work in, a, in an office. Yeah. 30% said they would quit if they would, if they get put back in the wow. office. I have clients that do Uber and they say that people are willing to pay any service charge. Um, Uber allows them to charge whatever they want to take food and stuff. And there are more people ordering food and groceries to be delivered to their houses mm-hmm. now. Um, and then the other one that we saw was that was kind of interesting and kind of surprising was that how many people are changing professions Yeah, because when they got shut down, they were hurting financially and they don't want it to happen again. So you're looking at different things of, of how many people I know so many hairdressers now that are becoming um, real estate agents. Like they're just oh, quitting so hair many. and becoming yeah. real estate agents yeah. because yeah. this really hurt them, you know, and I invested too much time, blood, sweat and tears and energy and sacrifice too much to give up on what I do. And I love doing hair. Um, mm-hmm. I think I'm the same. Um, but when you look at that and you look at people's habits and what they're doing and changing, it was like this was the next evolution of of what's happening. People want or want convenience. They want things to come to you. There's a culture on Instagram that all these kids want this Hollywood glam thing. And what they equate that to is, you know, people cater to them, you know, come to me, cater to me, do my, you know, yeah. glam me up and all that stuff. Um, so that was a big equation in what we were doing is looking at that and saying, there's a huge change here. When the, the, the what do they call it? The great uh, recession happened. Mm-hmm. And you look at people's habits. What was the one thing as hairdressers, people always said, so, uh, salons are recession proof. Well, it showed that we weren't. And one of the things that came out of it was the ombre, which I hated for so long. Um, and, and what it did was took clients from coming every four to six weeks to now they were coming two or three times a year where we're losing money because we changed the game. And what happened after? They wanted to keep the ombre. They loved right. it because they realized that it saved them money. They didn't have to come in and get color all the time. And now you look at what's happening now. People are letting their hair go natural. People are letting their gray come out. People are... Sure. I went a year without a haircut and color. This is, it's not that bad. People aren't coming in and spending the money they're spending the way they used to. Um, sure. There's still people that are scared to leave their house. You know, there's, there's lots of factors. So we said, how can we cut a lot of those factors out, give something fresh and different, right? So a client that might be like, well, I don't know if I want to get my hair done. Well, I come to your front door. Oh, wait, that's interesting. You know, you mm-hmm. know, I'm, Clients I get that I go to the front door and no matter what time of day they come out in their pajamas and their sandals and just hang out in the van. And it's just like, <laughs> seriously, you would never come to the salon like this. I know, but I'm in front of my house and this is cool. Kids yeah. are in and out. They don't need a babysitter. You know, kids come into the van, say whatever, and they go back into the house. If the mom has color, she doesn't have to stay in the van. She can go inside the house and process, do work, finish her work mm-hmm. on the computer, whatever she's doing. Like, I'm cutting mm-hmm. my time for them, you know? So it's just a matter of, of how do we change the situation better for us and actually move into the future because i really think the salons are changing the industry is changing and there's going to be another shift again there's always shifts in the business absolutely so yeah and that was one of the reasons i was really excited to have you guys on just because there has been such an evolution in both of your careers and i i think that it's so cool because it, it's almost like I don't think people would picture, oh, well, he owned this 5,000 square foot salon, you know, three stories, and now he's in a sprinter van. Well, I mean, I think at this point, there are so many people probably watching right now that are like, oh my gosh, yes, I'd much prefer the sprinter van. Like, I would so much rather do that at this point in my life. And so, and I, and I doubt you would have thought that back when you were owning that 5,000 square foot salon no. and in that moment. And it messes with your head a little bit because so like our salon before our last salon was a sola space and it was quite small. And so then we go to our 2000 square foot salon and we had this huge space, which was amazing to, to do so many things in teach and all these wonderful events. And, you know, now the van is the size of what our changing room alone was (laughs) in the last salon. (laughs) And it's like, you, you just really have to flip your, 
your gratitude from, because I would stand in our huge salon and go, oh, so grateful for all the space we have to get to do what we have to do. Sure. And I would look in our changing room and go, God, that's the size of our old salon. <laughs> and then now we're back to that, but it's like gratitude for a whole different thing now for the word you used earlier, freedom to reinvent, recreate. Um, to do it always happy instead of sinking under this wave of being like a victim for the past year that so many of us can fall into because it's just mm -hmm. been one hell of a year so but here's here's even the bigger thing is when we talk about being boss and ownership right oh i own a salon but do you own the building how many salon owners own the building well right. you don't really own the salon you own the idea of a salon you have a paper you have keys but you're paying rent to somebody, right? McDonald's, if you look at McDonald's and see how they run, they don't make money off the franchise. They own the land that the mm -hmm. McDonald's on. So they're making money off the land, right? So I had a 5,000 square foot lot for six years. I would have kept paying monthly on that thing for another 10, 15 years, how salons do. And you yeah. see none of that at the end. I take this, I pay it off. It's mine. I own it. Everything I do after that is money in the bank. No yeah. matter what I charge, how many people I see a day, that is all profit. You just cut your margin down completely. And going back to the old, of, well, that's stupid. I would never own a mobile salon. That's like cheap hairdressing. Well, really? What's it about? How much is it about how much money you have in your pocket? At the end of the day, working less, making more. You know, one of the guys does what we do. We just talked to him and he was giving us some advice. He charges $250 per client for a haircut. And he does basically men's hair. He's a barber. <laughs> He's a barber. I'm like, where are you finding guys yeah. to pay you $250? I won't do guys because they won't pay $65. You're finding guys that he's like, I do four people a day. Yep. And I call it a day. $250 a pop. Quick barber haircuts. And I'm out. Right? Presentation, you know, convenience. Like, it's there's a there's a thing, a whole benefit to it. Well, I think, I don't know, the message here for me is it's so much like, oh, you should give up your salon and get a van. It's more... Um, there's there's a way out of if you're feeling stuck in the situation you're in, reinvent, you know. And it took it took a lot of him convincing me. Like I had to take on my new word was adapt. We've got. He just kept saying we've got to adapt. We've got to adapt. And I'm so stuck on like the blood, sweat, and tears we put in our beautiful salon. It's like I don't want to hear about it you know? but just you know reinventing and and adapting and not being afraid to do something that looks completely different one thing that was huge for us this year this past year is we had to let go of a lot of like you said standards and ideals oh it should look this way it should be that way hairdressers should act and talk and think and perform this way and do business that way and that's so unprofessional i mean that all just went out the window <laughs> and you know we all know people that had to do what they had to do to survive yes. here so this was our not have to do because I, I don't personally believe you have to do anything in life. I think it's all choices you make and you have the power to say yes or no to whatever you want to. You're just going to have a particular end result at the end of that choice. Yes. But choose. Don't decide based on some sort of reason that's controlling you because of your circumstances. Choose because that's what you choose to do for no other reason than that's what you choose to do. Good, bad, indifferent, middle, left, right, whatever. <laughs> so. Absolutely. These are your power. Control your circumstance. Yeah. Right. And now Melissa's biggest thing isn't about, hey, can I go take the band of your hair? It's when are we going camping? <laughs> I love it. Just sure. Take off. So we put in a couple hard weeks and then we take off and take a trip take somewhere. Take the van and go camping. Take the dogs and empty out the salon and throw in our camping gear and <laughs> just go. Yep. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I think that um, you're going to have a couple people hitting you up because Joanne said, yeah, go ahead and make the fleet. Um, they're down to work. And I think Shirley's pretty interested here. So I, th I think you're going to have some people uh, hitting you up. <laughs> but, you know, this has been such a great conversation, y'all. And thank you both so much for taking time to, to share this story. I, I think that, you know, the thing I'm really taking away is exactly what you both just shared at the end there, which is, we have to be willing to adapt and we have to be willing to take control of our circumstances. And, you know, yeah, I think a lot of people on know that sensation, especially in the last year of feeling kind of like 
Oh, I'm in the victim role. And I, I just love the story that you guys have of, I'm not going to play the victim here. I'm going to figure out something else out, do the research and do the work. And I'm going to create the lifestyle I want to have. You're right. And yeah. I just want to throw in one last thing that somebody out there needs to hear about this is it's not easy. It, this is one of the hardest things we've ever done. There's been literally blood, sweat, and many tears. Sure. <laughs> Lots of pep talks, and we can do this. We'll figure it out. Um, but you know, I just know I was one of those people that would look up to people and go, oh, "God, how did this seem so easy for them?" And it's like, it's anything. We all know the saying: anything worth it is it's never going to be yeah. easy, right? So yeah, absolutely. Just know what is your carrot at the end of the stick, and what matters to you. Yeah, what matters to you. That's the most yeah. important thing. Love it. Yeah. Well, thank you both. The, again, this was just so fantastic. And everyone, please make sure you go connect with them um, at Melissa Jacqua and Abe's is at Hair Shaman. And you can follow their lovely tour within the van on, on their social. And I'm sure that both of you would be willing to, to share what you've experienced or, you know, Absolutely. things like that with people too. Absolutely. And, we, and we are big on the circle of influence. And this is what we tell everybody that's in our that does this stuff with us is now you're in our circle. So we're here for anything, yeah, anytime. We, no secrets, anything you want to know. We try to be completely open and uh, transparent and authentic. And, yeah. and uh, we just want to thank you, Andrew, for having this platform. Thank you, Sam, the whole gang that put this thing on. And just yeah. for everything that you do to contribute back to not only hairdressers, but humanity. We just think you're amazing. So thank mm. you for being an inspiration to us. As Sam, well. Sam met me when I was super young too, like 19. Yeah. Yeah. And he, him and Chris were doing shows together and it was me, Kelly and Takash. And they always mentored us. Oh, I love Sam and Chris. They were amazing. <laughs> and yeah. Always uh -huh. heart. <laughs> My heart is full and warm. I love it. What a great way to end the day. So awesome. Well, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, Abe. Thank you, Melissa. Please show them some love in the comments here and reach out and connect with them soon. Thank you. Tequila, guacamole, Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> yeah. Happy fifth. That's, happy fifth. <laughs> what do you think's been in this cup? <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Thank you.